And this is where I'm going to be meeting my guest for today, robot creator, Mr. Tomotaka Takahashi. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for being with us today, and I see you've brought one of your creations with you. Thank you. This is Roby. Hi, Roby. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi there. Tomotaka Takahashi is a robot creator. He specializes in designing and building small humanoid robots. In 2004, he created Croino, a robot that drew global attention. Time magazine named it one of the coolest inventions of the year. In August 2013, a robot named Kirobo, created by Takahashi, went into space, where it had conversations with a Japanese astronaut. Takahashi currently serves as an associate professor at the University of Tokyo, where he devotes himself to developing new robots. Japan's known as a major player in the field of robotics. What would you say are the unique characteristics of Japanese robots? Well, take manga, anime and video games. These are all important aspects of Japanese pop culture. And in each category, you often encounter a future in which humanoid robots are simply a part of everyday life. They communicate with people. That vision of the future, which you find in Japanese fiction, is shared by the Japanese public. Those of us who develop robots also have that vision in mind as we do our work. Having this shared background makes it easier for people in Japan to be open to the idea of humanoid robots. I know you specialize in humanoid robots and Robbie is one of your latest creations. What sort of things can he do? Robbie can do basic communication using voice recognition. Try talking to him. understands 270 words. It even has a built-in remote control for the TV. Robbie is designed to play a positive role in everyday life. Out of all the many different types of robots uh, that there are, what's the appeal of humanoids for you? For communication, I realized that a robot having a humanoid shape is actually very significant. Why do we need to communicate with robots? These days, we already have smartphones and other devices with voice recognition all around us. But people don't use their phone's voice recognition very often, do they? Mm. On the other hand, people who have a pet at home, like a goldfish or a turtle, will talk to it all the time. Oh. The reason that we don't use the voice recognition on our devices regularly is that we don't like talking to these boxes. But if the device looks like a human, then a person can emotionally connect with it. 
And then in turn, it's much easier for that person to have a nice, natural conversation with the robot. So now, let me show you around my lab. Okay, so look. Whoa, got a whole wall of drawers here. I wonder what's in there. I keep all my tools and parts in these. And I do my work sitting on the floor. Oh, really? Okay, I'll join you then. So, how does it all work? First, I draw sketches. They range from design elements to blueprints of individual parts and their dimensions. It's all quite precise, isn't it? But you're not using a computer for any of this. No. Wow. I have to hold the components in my hands and think about how to fit them together. If you just arrange data, digital models, on the computer, you always end up with a design that's very flat and generic. Takahashi handles the whole creation process, from technology development to design to assembly, all by himself. He handcrafts everything down to the smallest parts, making minute adjustments along the way until the robot approaches the image he has in his mind. You certainly have your own way of doing things. Is there a sort of philosophy behind your ideas in robot making? I want people to feel an attachment to these humanoid robots. I want them to build relationships of sympathy and trust with robots. I'd say that's my philosophy. When I switch this robot on, he starts climbing, and he does it very inefficiently. But he gives the impression that he's really trying hard, and that makes people feel like cheering him on. Think about the head. It doesn't serve any purpose in climbing the rope. But without the head, it would just look like a machine. The head moves as he climbs, and it makes it look as though he's straining with all his might. So it's not just about being purely rational. I'm always thinking about how to incorporate human touches when I'm making robots. In 2008, Evolta climbed up the Grand Canyon, powered only by two alkaline batteries. Takahashi's robots have something that makes people want to root for them. We've seen Robbie and we've seen Evolta, um, and they have a kind of sweetness and lovability about them, which I think you see in a lot of Japanese robots. And that's something that seems to me to be very Japanese. You, you don't see this with robots in, in other countries. Japanese robots have robotic elements and human elements. They have both. They seem to exist somewhere in between human and machine. I think that's the key. The robots we see in Hollywood movies are either just simple machines that, of course, you couldn't be friends with, or else they're trying to wipe out humanity, rule the Earth, things like that. Like the replicants in Blade Runner. Or the Terminators. Mm -hmm. This is a short film that Takahashi and his colleagues made. It shows an imagined future in which robots are integrated into human society. Takahashi is looking forward to the day when humans and robots living side by side is simply something that's taken for granted. Looking a little bit into the future, do you see a day when we'll be able to go out to our local electrical store and mm. buy a small humanoid robot? Mm -hmm. I think that within a few years, you'll be able to buy a robot at the same place where you buy your mobile phone. Basically, they'll have the functions of today's smartphones, but they'll also have arms, legs and a head. So you don't even hold it up to your ear anymore, you just kind of... <laughs> well, maybe. Or it may be fun to hold the robot up to your ear. <laughs> <laughs> when people start to converse naturally with humanoid robots, there may be some associated anxiety. But people will entrust personal information, like their lifestyle preferences, to their robots. Using that data, the robot could offer personalized services and information. A new product came out. Are you interested in it? That kind of thing. 
We already use our computers or smartphones to look up information and make purchases. The same principles used to collect information about those activities could be applied to a robot that people relate to more than a machine, a robot they relate to as a trusted and loved companion. I believe that robots will be the next wave of communications devices. Everyone will keep one in their pocket or in their bag, and then, when they need to, they'll pull it out and talk to it. In Japan, there's this idea of using robots as a medium for communication. I'm still not quite sure whether I buy into that or not. And it'll be interesting to see when they do become uh, marketable objects, as people like yourself are trying to make them now. Will that be something that people will buy into around the world, or will it be just just the Japanese who get it. Well, human beings prefer a human style of communication. That's true everywhere. So I don't think it will be just the Japanese who will be conversing with these small robots one day. I think it'll be people all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.